you can't medicalize your way out of this, Job. It's not 100% the answer, even though you believe right now it is. It's part of the answer, but you do need a whole body approach. Hey guys, can you reclaim your life from chronic fatigue even if you're not 100% back on track yet? Today, we're going to explore how to live a full, joyful life despite lingering symptoms and challenges. Hey everyone, I'm Raylan. If you're new here, welcome. On this channel, we explore recovery journeys from conditions like ME-CFS and long COVID and talk about what works for different people and what doesn't. Today, I'm excited to introduce Joe Thomas over in Hampshire in the UK. On top of chronic fatigue syndrome, Joe was also diagnosed with dysautonomia and POTS, and her journey took a challenging turn during the pandemic, leading to burnout and a relapse. While she isn't 100% back yet, Jo now lives a fulfilling life and is here to share her story and insights on finding purpose and joy, no matter where you are on your healing journey. So let's welcome Jo. Jo, amazing to have you here today. Thank you for doing this. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So uh, how did this whole journey start for you? So it goes back to 2017 when I was diagnosed with dysautonomia and uh, under that umbrella term for conditions that affect the autonomic nervous system, I experienced POTS is the main thing. So um, POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Taking that down to its most simplest part um, parts is uh, when we kind of go from sat or lay down to stood up we get an excessive rise in heart rate that doesn't calm down. And because your heart rate is beating along much faster than it should be, you get a variety of symptoms. And uh, I know we'll cover this in this interview, but one of those for me, one of the main symptoms was persistent, relentless chronic fatigue, which was incredibly challenging to deal with, which I know you know about and most of your audience know about. So I hear people talk about dysautonomia autonomia. Oh, I even have trouble saying it. I never mind fully understanding it. So what does that term refer to? The processes that occur autonomically in our bodies controlled by the autonomic nervous system just occur without us even having to think about it. So they can control things like our heart rate, our breathing and our blood pressure, hormonal balance, so many things. But under the condition of dysautonomia, any of those processes that occur in the autonomic nervous system can become disrupted or out of sync. So people with dysautonomias can experience such a huge variety of symptoms and problems. Like I said, for me, the main one was POTS, where we get an excessive rise in heart rate. And that caused many symptoms such as, you know, feeling the excessive heart rate, the palpitations, shortness of breath lightheadedness, dizziness. Uh, I would feel very faint at times. Luckily, I never did faint, but many people do. We have an inability maintaining our blood pressure with it. Uh, and because all these things are going on and your heart is beating like it's an anaerobic exercise regime, almost 24-7, you really do become very exhausted with it. And that's where the chronic fatigue element comes from. So you clearly have a really good understanding now of what's happening or what was happening with you. But I imagine initially you had no idea. So what was it like when these symptoms first started coming on and what did you think was happening? So when the symptoms first came on, it started with, I went out dog walking one day with my dog, came back and found a tick adhered to my skin. You know, I didn't think anything of it. I just removed it, head attached, and it was pretty small, like it hadn't sucked up much blood disposed of it and just went on, you know, went on with my day. But the next day when I woke up, I really didn't feel right. Uh, I felt really weak, completely out of sync, almost slightly out of it. And uh, I was due to go to work. Uh, so I am a coach as well, but I'm also a nurse. So I was due to go and do my nursing job. And I said to my husband, I really don't feel right. But up to that point, I'd been gradually getting quite exhausted just with, you know, the routines of busy modern day life, being a mom and stuff. Um, so I said, I'm just going to get myself into work, get through the day, come home, eat supper. And I'm just going to go to bed really early because I've been overdoing it. And it's about time I did something about it. But going into work, so I got myself into work. And then there was a short, we have a... Um, 
in the hospital. It's a short walk from the staff car park to the side entrance to the hospital. And just on that very short walk, I started to feel even more strange. I had vertigo. I felt really dizzy. I felt lightheaded. I had this really strange sensation that my lower legs didn't exist anymore. And I thought, my goodness, this is so odd. I'm just going to get into work and go and sit down. I've really been overdoing it. My body's just saying I need some rest. And uh, got into work and, you know, I'm British. I thought I'll just have a cup of tea. A cup of tea will sort all of this out. Uh, but clearly it wasn't going to. Um, and I really thought I was going to pass out. So I just sat myself on the floor of the staff changing room, tried to get up a few times to go and, you know, get a colleague or, you know, maybe get a glass of water and just felt like I couldn't get up. Um, then one of my colleagues came into the changing room and they must have just thought, what on earth is Jo doing on the floor? You know, she's the like, go, go, go person. And she said, gosh, you really don't look right. And I said, you know, I really don't feel okay. Uh, and I said, I just feel really odd. I got bitten by a tick yesterday, but I think it's far too soon for this to be a problem for me. I think I'm just exhausted. And I think my body's just saying I need rest now. And they did a few sort of tests. You know, I'm in a hospital. And the only thing we could really note was this excessive heart rate. And they wanted me to, my colleagues wanted me to go downstairs to ED to be investigated. And I thought, I'm not doing that. You know, I just, I'm really tired. I just want to go home and sleep. And I don't want all this fuss being created. <laughs> so my husband collected me and I, I went home. I had an appointment with the GP the same day. I just slept and slept and slept. My husband woke me up to take me to the GP appointment. When I got there, I just said to my GP, oh, I'm exhausted. You know, my body's finally saying I just need to do something about this. And uh, he said, you know, Joe, you really don't look very well at all. I think there's something more going on. And uh, he did a few things. He did uh, an ECG. I think in the States you call it an EKG. And it just showed this really fast high heart rate. And uh, he said, well, given your age and the fact you're normally fit and well, and this is quite sudden, I'm going to refer you to a cardiologist. And I thought he was actually being a bit dramatic. So it was quite role reversal in my situation, because I know a lot of people really push to get a diagnosis and attention from the medical field. And he felt it was probably, you know, a problem with my thyroid or um, a problem with my adrenal glands sending off bursts of adrenaline or um, an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat. So I thought, okay, fine. And all I wanted to do was go home, curl up in a ball and go to sleep. Uh, so I did that and I just wasn't getting better. If anything, I was getting worse. So a few days passed and I thought, actually, I'm really glad my GP has done a referral to a cardiologist because, you know, I'm really not okay. Um, and what my GP had done as he gave me this little device, I think it's called a Cardia, a little ECG machine that you put on the back of your mobile phone. You just tap it with your two thumbs and it just does a one uh, single rhythm strip trace of an ECG. And that was saying I had an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. But when I really looked at the trace, I could see it wasn't uh, because this, you know, there's various little beats and bobs that pick up with a heartbeat. And one of them's called a P wave. And I could see they were there. They're absent if you have atrial fibrillation. But I think the problem was when I was getting the excessive heart rate, I was probably getting a surge of adrenaline. It was making me shake. And I think that was interfering with the trace. Uh, but fortunately, it did lead to a diagnosis because I decided then to Google the reliability of this device. And actually, its reliability was really, really very good. But I could see some people were using it to diagnose POTS. And just out of medical curiosity, I decided to look it up. And lo and behold, it read textbook example of what I was experiencing. And I was noticing strange things like I, if I was laid down, I'd feel much better. And if I went from touching my toes to stood up just twice, I'd have all of my symptoms. So I 
went back to my GP to discuss this with him. Um, I'd seen online uh, via a website called POTS UK, there were some specialists in the UK and there was one quite close to me, luckily, geographically. And I asked, asked well, sorry, it was a, a him originally, a chap. And when I went back, it was a female. I asked if I could have a referral and thinking, I don't know if they're going to go with this. They're going to want to do all the usual investigations first. And she just said, yeah, sure. That seems to make a lot of sense to me. So I was referred uh, and quite quickly I was diagnosed and put on appropriate treatment with medication, a medicine called Avabradine, just to slow down that excessive heart rate. And that did give me some stability in my symptoms you know, particularly the fast heart rate, the shortness of breath, the palpitations. It took the edge off some of the lightheadedness and the dizziness I was experiencing. But what really did persist, despite that improving, was the chronic fatigue element. And uh, that was definitely the worst symptom, the most challenging. Plus brain fog and just this general sort of weakness. So that's what I mean, sorry, I've even forgot what the original question is. I just keep talking. That's what his autonomy is. That's what happened to me. I think that was the question. Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. That was very informative. So thank you for taking the time to walk through all that. I have a lot of people reaching out to me asking for more information and resources about POTS, and it's just something I know very little about and haven't had a lot of people talk about it at depth. Um, on the channel so yeah very helpful especially someone is with the you know the medical background and the knowledge that you have um, that was that was very good thank you and I would if people are wanting to know a little bit more I would suggest looking at POTS UK because they write their information in a very clear and concise easy to understand way so it's a great resource and um, you know they were the main symptoms I had but because it was a dysautonomia and that can affect any of the autonomic nervous systems in the body, I would just have these really strange symptoms that would crop up crop up with no rhyme nor reason. So I'd have aching, burning joints, which I know can be quite common with cro chronic fatigue anyway. And then just things like uh, GI disturbances, like reflux. And I would have problems on and off with swallowing as if the autonomic processes that control the sw swallowing reflex were just out of sync. And uh, like you know, neurological things, like my legs would just all of a sudden feel numb, and I wouldn't be able to coordinate them or control them. So it was it was a, it's a very strange one, um, and it can just throw off so many things. And I didn't realize that this sort of dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system was at the core of what's happening with POTS. You know, of course, it makes sense. Now I see why there's so much overlap um, with chronic fatigue syndrome and, you know, fibromyalgia and long COVID, because so many people, as I'm sure you've noticed, um, have noticed that when they address that ANS component, their nervous system, it really helps with their recovery because it seems to be at the core of these other conditions, at least for some people as well. So that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh even though the medication got me so far and a degree of stability, it was doing those lifestyle changes and pacing and doing things to address nervous system regulation and brain retraining that took me into like another phase of recovery. And uh, I maybe should have said this at the start of the interview. So you do recovery stories, which is brilliant because it provides inspiration, knowledge and resources for people. But um you may not remember, because I think it was maybe a year ago, I contacted you about possibly doing this recovery story. And then just with our calendars, it you know just took this long to get together. Mm -hmm. Mine is I'm not a fully recovered recovery story. And I think, you know, it's quite nice to have these stories in the field because it shows that, uh, you know, we can still be on a recovery journey, but have a very good quality of life. And we don't necessarily need to be fully recovered to be OK. So, I mean, I'm probably 95% there, but uh, I do have to work on still pacing myself a little bit intuitively uh, to keep the balance and keep my energy levels good. And also to sort of things that keep my nervous system reg uh, regulated and in check. And uh, sometimes when I've listened to people's recovery stories, which I find really inspiring, when I listen closely, um, they don't necessarily always go back to their old lives. They change things up to help them, you know, maintain a wellness. 
life. So it was just also to be able to highlight that element of this in this recovery, not fully recovered story. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think all very few people that I've talked to went back to their old life. It very much transformed them, who they are, their idea of self-care, their, you know, just the way they live in their own skin, the way they understand their body, their priorities in life, their boundaries, their um, just all, all different sorts of things. It seems to be the path to recovery, such a key component of it. So yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad that you brought that up because it's something we don't talk about enough about this sort of not fully recovered, um, you know, living in that phase. But before we get more into that, I think people watching, and I would love to know more about what those specific steps were that you did that got you to this 95% place. Okay, so there was the medical man management and the medication to start with. Then there was, um, well, what was happening at my with my life at that point was, I was wondering, wanting to know why I why I had developed this sort of dysautonomia in pots, and because I was bitten by the tick, I was wondering, did I have Lyme's disease? So I was looking for more and more sensitive tests to see if I had Lyme, mm -hmm. and actually, time was just ticking on. This was taking up much of my time and energy, which was pretty limited anyway. And I was just going round in circles, and it was feeling like Groundhog Day, and I was just really, I was feeling very stuck. I decided one day, you know, enough was enough. You know, I'm fed up with this path. I need to do something different. So I took some time out to reflect on what I'd learned in my nursing career. And I sort of spent time thinking about the patients I had encountered with, with chronic illnesses who did really well despite. And this is what I learned from, you know, speaking to them and nursing them. I didn't learn this in textbooks. And it was basically, I could see they had a different mindset to people that were just okay with their chronic illness or not progressing and not doing very well. And the conclusions I came to was the patients that did well with chronic illness were ones who had a mindset that was conducive with being in the wellness zone rather than being in an ill health sort of model. They, 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 they felt they had the abilities to recover or have a good quality of life. They felt it was within them to take measures, to put, sorry, put measures in place to improve their health and functional ability. So I had then reflected upon myself and I thought, yeah. actually, if I'm trying to chase answers to why this has occurred, this has me dependent upon finding answers in the future before I can get better. And actually, I don't think that's serving me very well because I do know there are measures I can put into place now that will improve my health and energy levels. And I'm not allocating my energy to that at the moment. So I'm going to shift that around. I gave myself a bit of perspective check and I started to implement lifestyle changes. They include things like uh, improving my diet. I mean, it wasn't necessarily a bad diet to start with. But I had got into a bit of a vicious circle with my low energy levels of chasing my day with sugary snacks and caffeine. You know, I had two young daughters to uh, look after. I was very much in survival mode, even though I knew better not to do it because it wasn't going to help me long term. So I addressed that. I cleaned up my diet, you know, just sort of cooking from raw natural ingredients which admittedly does take more time and energy. But I just started bulk, bulk cooking and freezing meals. So that really helped. I reduced my caffeine right down just to one coffee in the morning. Other things I, did, I started to notice once my energy levels improved a bit and I wasn't having so many symptoms was if I had an alcoholic drink, that was making me feel really weak. So I stopped drinking which I think also helped my sleep uh, because, you know, alcohol can help us fall asleep, but it does disrupt our sleep. It fragments it during the night, particularly taking us out of that REM sleep. And one of the things I was experiencing with the chronic fatigue was, you know, I would be so tired I could cry, but I couldn't sleep. And I know that paradigm is often what people with chronic fatigue uh, experience. It's kind of a cruel one. But, you know, taking out some of the sugary snacks, taking out the caffeine, taking out the alcohol, plus some other measures we'll speak about later on, 
helped improve my sleep. And if I had a better night's sleep, my symptoms weren't so bad the next day. I started some supplementation. Uh, some of these supplements were recommended to be my to me by my cardiologist. So, uh, you know, B vitamins, a C vitamin, a vitamin D, because we live in the norm northern hemispheres in the UK, magnesium. When I had my pot, I took coenzyme Q10, which really helped me, which I haven't, I haven't spoken about this. So as time ticked on, I got a lid on my pot symptoms and I was doing really well. But nursing on the front line during the COVID pandemic was really stressful. The nervous system regulation kind of went a bit. I wasn't taking care of myself anymore. I went into this sort of, I don't know, Mother Teresa type mode. Like, this isn't going to be pretty. I've got to be here, there, everywhere, all at once. I was working in ICU. I was surprised how long I was okay for. And then I fell in a heap. I really burnt out. I had burnout fatigue and all of my POTS symptoms came back. So I took some time out from nursing to look after myself. During that phase, I tried uh, D-ribose, which really helped again. But admittedly, with the supplementation, there was also the other lifestyle changes going on, plus pacing, which I haven't spoken about yet. Uh, I was improving. To set, so to be able to say one thing really helped or one thing was more effective than another, I can't claim that. And I know with supplementation, different people have different responses. And some people do well for a few months and then the effect seems to sort of tail off. So it's, you know, it's very person specific, but I did them. They seem to help. I still take some of those supplements still now. And then Pacing, which I haven't spoken about, I think this, you know, with the perspective change and the mindset change, I think pacing was one of the most crucial parts of it. So when I started doing this in 2017, I didn't even know it was called pacing. I just thought it's energy management. I didn't know collectively it was called pacing. But, and I was never taught it as a nurse. I just yet again, thinking about those patients I'd looked after who had limited energy uh, from various health conditions, I hadn't come across somebody of chronic fatigue by this point. I just knew they needed to be really careful with their limited energies. Mm -hmm. They needed to prioritize what they were going to use their energy on. They needed to streamline their routines. They needed to get rid of a lot of activities that weren't necessary. And then they had to pace themselves throughout the day. They couldn't just get up, do all the tasks they needed to do, and then rest all afternoon because they would fall in a heap. So I started to pace myself and I learned very much by trial and error. As a coach now, I do coach people regarding pacing for fatigue management. So if I was to go back and help Joe now, I would do such a much, much better job. But I found my way eventually. I, I devised charts on my bedroom wall that had times for sleep and rest and various activities. And I started to learn that actually it wasn't just the physical activities I needed to pay attention to. It was also the emotional and mental activities I engaged in because they all use up our energy. And, uh, and I know from coaching clients, sometimes the mental and emotional activities can be more energy demanding than the physical one, depending on the person. So I had my charts going, I was evaluating what I did each day and what effect that had on my energy levels and my sleep and other fatigue related symptoms. And I got to my, I got then to a point of stability. But when it came to pacing up, it was another thing I learned the hard way because in the first year I would think, oh, this is amazing. I'm feeling so much better. And after a few weeks, I would just try and return to my normal life. And, uh, I'd be okay for a day or two and then I would just crash and burn and be, you know, low in mood, in the dumps, you know, loads of flare-ups of symptoms, set right back and having to start again. So I learned that I had to just do very small incremental increases in activity, give it a chance and see if I was okay for my body to be doing that right now. Um if it wasn't time, I used to be really set back mentally. So I also learned that actually I just needed to be more forgiving with myself. And what I 
uh, what helped me was to start to view it as I was testing the waters. I was testing the waters to see if I was ready for that increase in activity level. And if I wasn't, you know, it was just a learning opportunity. I wasn't ready for it. So I just would take it back a notch or two, give myself some stability mm -hmm. and then move on again. And uh, I quickly learned it was very important to be noticing mm -hmm. patterns in myself. So, yes, yeah, so that was pacing. It's still part of my life. I think it's great for keeping the balance. And when things are slightly out of sync, I might get a very mild pot symptoms. It's, you know, I might feel a bit more tired or I can have blurred vision in my peripheral fields. And I, just, I don't worry about it. And I think that's key because I'm, you know, not revving up my <laughs> nervous system to start panicking about these things. I'm just like, OK, I note it. I just need to check where the balance needs to be in my life. Life, and I need to implement what is required and then I'm okay again mm -hmm. and sometimes it can just be maybe a bit more rest or sometimes it's just I need to implement a few more practices for nervous system regulation and then that keeps me good so that was like the next stage of my recovery I mentioned it briefly uh within all that context, uh, I did burn out as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I burnt out was I had medical management, I had lifestyle uh, changes I put into place, and I had had a bit of mind mindset shifts going on. But I wasn't really doing the sort of I think a lot of people in your audience will collectively know it as brain retraining. That really wasn't occurring because I wasn't aware of it and nervous system regulation practices. So after I burnt out, took some time out of nursing to recuperate and I embarked on my NLP coaching diploma. And it was from doing that, I got a lot of insights into what my next stage of recovery and healing needed to be and how to implement these things. So that's got me to this stage now where, you know, I have a very full life. My energy levels are high. Yeah. But like I said, I can get the occasional symptom, but I just respond appropriately. And so, yeah, that brings me to where I am now. How do people, I don't know if you speak to people about this um, in the conventional medical system, but I'm curious, you know, do you hear professionals in that setting talking about nervous system regulation and brain retraining? I don't. I don't. So I represent sort of two worlds that come together more, and I would love to see that in the medical field more. What I am more aware of is... People in the medical field talking about mindset more. Um, and I'm noticing there's a lot more in-house training for nurses, doctors, healthcare professionals with regard to coaching. But it isn't nervous system regulation and brain retraining. So brain retraining, I just call it rewiring of neural pathways yeah. and uh, NLP. So they're not doing that, but they are empowering patients to look at themselves more, look what they can do, how they can maybe reduce anxiety and stress. So it is a nod to that that didn't exist a few years ago. And a lot of what I learned was via my personal journey and then eventually doing a coaching diploma with NLP in it. And just, you know, my own research as I went along. Um, so I'm really grateful that I was an observant person and spent as much time as possible as I could in my nursing career talking to patients and observing what made the differences because I wasn't taught this in a classroom. I didn't read it in a textbook. I learned from people. And then I started to implement that on myself when I needed it. And then learned, you know, from trial and error, some lessons the hard way of what it meant. And then just more and more research and more training myself. So the medical field is improving in that regard. Um, the cardiologist that diagnosed me with POTS back in 2017, so she, she actually diagnosed me with dysautonomia and she said, yeah, POTS. Um, she was a much more holistic practitioner and she sort of helped me on this journey a little bit as well. And she had mm. POTS herself, so she really got it. But uh, I do remember her saying back then she was the only female cardiologist in a team of chaps. And she was often referred to as the white witch because what she believed in. So 
I'm hoping that wouldn't happen now. So there is still a long way for the medical field to go. But, you know, medical management got me so far and I needed it. But what I really needed was a whole body approach. They honoured the mind and body connection. And I think it's so true of so many people in so many situations. And what we do know in medicine is that um, a lot of people, well, people have, can have a genetic predisposition to certain conditions, but it's environmental factors, usually stress, that trigger the things to be active. So we know this. So why aren't we addressing the stress, the nervous system regulation, the brain retraining stuff? So I would love for the, fu the future to be in Western medicine. We're getting closer to that. But yeah, and I think it depends on who you see in terms of a practitioner. So a lot of my clients over the last few years since starting my own private coaching work, as well as nursing and the NHS, are from the medical field. There's been a lot of doctors. So they've had that personal journey themselves and can see the difference that it makes when you're not just following a pure medical management model. So yeah, I'm rambling. It, it, it's, it, it's kind of like what I would dream for had to happen for medicine in the future, but we'll have to wait and see. But also with long COVID, unfortunately, it's been so many people affected by long COVID, but many specialities now have patients coming through their door with long COVID mm -hmm. and they're looking at other practices to help them along. So they're talking about things like pacing, but they're also talking about things like strategies you can put in place to reduce stress and anxiety and calm yourself. And they do, I am hearing people talk about moving people from a state uh, in the nervous system from the sympathetic mode to parasympathetic mode. So I'm hearing those terms more and more in the medical field. And when I hear them, I'm like, yes, brilliant. Let's have some more of that. But yet again, I'm starting to ramble because, you know, I care a lot about this stuff. Well, it's very exciting and encouraging to hear that the needle is moving somewhat because it can often feel like it's not moving at all. So I'm sure the progress is not or the the shift towards this way of understanding conditions is not happening as fast as we would like it to, but it, you know, if it's at all happening, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really great thing to hear. I'm, I'm curious because you clearly have a lot of information and knowledge and insight about what these conditions and what you've been through as a result of your own personal experience and your training and experience um, with coaching you know, aside from what you've already shared, are there important things that if you could go back to 2017, you know, that you would want to tell yourself that you think could have helped you out on this journey? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I would tell myself in those early days is you can't medicalize your way out of this job. It's not 100% the answer, even though you believe right now it is. And I would tell myself it's part of the answer, but you do need a whole body approach one that honors the mind-body connection that you know exists because you have seen this throughout your career. You've maybe not fully taken notice of it, but you do know it. Um, I would tell myself to slow down, uh, trust myself a little bit more, listen to my body. Uh, I would tell myself that you're going to learn so much on this journey, things about, say, nervous system regulation, brain rewiring, the power of the brain with NLP and neuroplasticity, you're going to find it fascinating. And once you implement these things, your life is actually going to be enhanced and it's going to be the better for it. So I would be, very, you know, when I say this, I'm talking about myself specifically. I'm not saying that other people with chronic fatigue, dysautonomia and POTS should feel like this, but I'm actually very thankful for it. It's, it's been, it wasn't good at the time, but sat here now, it's a good thing. Yeah, very well said. Something that I definitely hear echoed in a lot of the interviews that I do, the vast majority, for sure. Um, I'm curious, you know, what do you do to keep yourself in this place of wellness so your POTS and your symptoms rarely affect you now? Okay, so like I said, I kind of intuitively pace myself. I do it without even thinking. Uh, if I do get a mild symptom, it's just a reminder to me I need to just have a look at what's going on my, in my life and readdress the balance so we're maintaining a balance. Because, 
you know, modern day society is fast paced and it can be stressful. And we just need to counteract that to keep ourselves in the wellness space. And actually, I learned pacing through necessity is what I needed at the time. But I think all of us, regardless of chronic illness, should be pacing ourselves. It's a, you know, it's like almost an essential life skill or life tool. So pacing, I think... I make decisions that are more aligned with my core values and beliefs now, which sounds very coaching related, but it's true because I think I follow the beat of my own drum now more than society's push, push, push culture and seeking external validation and constant need for productivity. So I I view life differently now. Um, I've reframed a lot of my sort of old schools of thought that I grew up with. I'm much more, I have more self-compassion and I show myself so much more grace now. And I think that's important because even though I've got to this stage and I am a coach, it doesn't mean life is perfect. And perfection is often an illusion. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still full of its ups and downs and you just navigate them so much better when you do show yourself some grace and self-compassion. And I think all of those things coming together keep you in the wellness zone. And you are doing coaching now, you mentioned, in addition to your nursing work. So what does that look like? So I nurse two days a week and then like we're doing now via a video call, I do coaching sessions. So I... I've established myself as a fatigue and burnout coach. So uh, for your audience, what will be relevant is I'm coaching people with chronic fatigue syndrome and other fatigue related chronic illnesses such as dysautonomia, POTS and long COVID. Uh, People can come to me and we can work together one on one in what I describe as open coaching. Whatever their goal is that they want to achieve, we look at how they can achieve that. And then I also have a pacing program that's only four sessions and it's called a pacing program, but probably only a quarter of it is really pacing. And then the other stuff is mindset work, reframing, uh, rewiring of the brain, nervous system regulation practices and any other challenges that they may be facing, such as they may have difficulty communicating their needs to loved ones or being heard. So, and all these things are so vitally important. And then I also have a burnout to balance program, which is six sessions, uh, which is actually very good for people that have come far in their recovery journey, but are maybe reiterate. Uh, reintroducing themselves to the work environment and they don't want to fall into the same old habits that got them into a state of maybe stress, overwork, burnout, uh, chronic illness. And with those two programs, there is quite a bit of overlap because there is pacing in the burnout to fit, um, yes, burnout to balance program. Um, and yet again, brain retraining, nervous system regulation, reframing. And it's it's about helping that individual move into a zone where they have the tools and equipment to bring up their energy levels, keep the balance and harmony in their lives as much as you can, because it does go out of sync occasionally. But when it does, that's fine. I'm bringing it back. Amazing. Well, uh, of course, all of this will be linked in the video description for people wanting to check it out and learn more. Um, just really excited that you um, are here today. I've learned so much from you and uh, so many, so many little light bulbs going out, so many sentences and phrases and like, oh, you captured that so well. I'm going to have to watch this again myself just to just to really um, sink it, uh, have it all sink in. So just thank you so much, Joe, for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your journey and your expertise uh, with us here today. Oh, well, no, it's a huge thank you for me for having the time. And I know you work full time and I don't quite know how you manage to do all this amazing work that you're doing. And I know it's so important to your community and uh, I'm hugely inspired inspired by everything you do. That means a lot to me. And yes, to people watching, if you have a story to tell, I have lots of people reaching out to me who are fully recovered, which is amazing. Um, But I know that it's really important to get stories of people who are 95%, 85%, 55%, wherever you are in your journey, 
you know you have a ton of insight. There's no way you get through this or even partially through this without learning a ton. And it's just, people tell me all the time how helpful it is to hear from people that are still experiencing some symptoms or still on their journey. So you can expand the video description and there's a link there if you want to reach out to me um, and talk to me about sharing your story as well. So yeah, thank you again, Joe. A uh, special thank you to our channel member, Bob, Bob Jansen. Thank you, Bob, for joining and supporting the channel. I hope you're enjoying the extra perks and uh, bonuses that that you get as a result of joining. And yeah, thanks to all of you watching as always. I look forward to your comments. I love reading them. Big hugs to you. Um, whatever you're facing, keep going. You have got this. Um, thank you for watching this video. Thanks for watching it to the end. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope you got a ton out of it and I hope to see you in this next one.